Our scripture for this morning comes from Paul's second letter to the Corinthians, 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 6 through 15. The point is this, the one who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and the one who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. Each of you must give as you have made up your mind, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to provide you with every blessing in abundance, so that by always having enough of everything, you may share abundantly in every good work. As it is written, he scatters abroad, he gives to the poor, his righteousness endures forever. The God who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will supply and multiply your seed for sowing and increase the harvest of your righteousness. You will be enriched in every way for your great generosity, which will produce thanksgiving to God through us. For the rendering of this ministry not only supplies the needs of the saints, but also overflows with many thanksgivings to God. Through the testing of this ministry, you glorify God by your obedience to the confession of the gospel of Christ and by the generosity of your sharing with them and with all others while they long for you and pray for you because of the surpassing grace of God that he has given you. Thanks be to God for his indescribable gift. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. So at the end of last year, uh, my family signed up for Peloton, which is one of those at-home exercise companies. We got the bike. They also have treadmills and stuff. And and you can do uh, like strength workouts, running workouts, meditation, yoga, all that kind of stuff. And, uh, you know, at the beginning, there was, uh, it was fun at the beginning, although the fun part was not the exercise. That's exhausting and it hurts. And that doesn't become fun for a couple weeks or a couple months. But the fun for me was trying out all the coaches, because they have a whole bunch of coaches. And now, to be fair, Peloton instructors are all variations on the same, like, personal fitness influencer, Hollywood looks, kind of Instagram people. But they all have different styles of coaching, just like there's different styles of pastors and teachers and and coaches and the like. So there's some that just want to entertain you and basically distract you from the pain. So they're dancing, cracking jokes, talking pop culture like it's a daytime TV show. In fact, one of those instructors is on Dancing with the Stars right now. Anybody watching dance? No? That just our family? Okay, cool. Um, Then then there's uh, the the coaches who were, they're almost like, they're almost like gurus. They always have mantras and inspirational quotes. And at the end of the workout, you feel like you've had a a therapy session in addition to your workout then there's the guy that's like the former military person he's a veteran he just yells at you the whole time like it's boot camp which doesn't really work on me because it's on a screen and I'm like I'm not even here dude but the 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 coaches that I've really connected with there's a small handful of coaches I've really connected with and they're all former athletes who are just kind of like this is what we do we're showing up and we're gonna work out and it's gonna be hard and that's okay that's why we're here we're going to get through it together. And there's one guy particularly connected with. His name is Coach Ben. He's also from the London studio, so it may just be the accent. I like British accents. But I, I really uh, enjoy taking classes with Coach Ben. And I'd been doing uh, rides with him for a while. And then I started to pick up that towards the end of the ride, we would finish up the ride. Uh, and, and he would say, you know, if you're done for the day, make sure you stretch, hydrate, and then have a great day. He's like, but if you got more energy in you, And that's usually the part where I stopped listening. But he said, if you got more energy with you, join me for a strength class. And it took me a couple weeks, maybe a couple months, to hear that because the blood was pounding in my head and I couldn't hear anything at the end of a ride. But then it also took me even longer to think that I still had more in me to do a strength class after a 20, 30, 45-minute bike ride. And of course, since I'm a pastor, that got me thinking and paralleling things with our spiritual life. And it got me thinking about how for all of us, we had an entry point in church. Right? For, for many of you, it may be worship because you're here at worship, but you might have joined through a social event or a Bible study or a service event. But a lot of us, we have something that we do as our spiritual exercise, essentially. And so for me, for a while, the bike was my exercise, and it took me a while to even think that I could do more. And the same is true in our spiritual lives. Perhaps you've been coming to worship for a while, and sure, you hear invitations to serve. You hear invitations to join a life group or a Bible study. You hear invitations to go serve, but you think, nope, this is what I do. I do Sunday morning. But after a while, as you start to grow and mature in your spiritual health, you begin to think, maybe I can do more. So I then started to take some strength classes, upper body. Obviously, I know you can tell I've been doing 10 months of weightlifting. These sleeves are awful tight. 
but almost at like every third upper body workout involved, some of you laughed too hard at that and looked at your neighbor like, <laughs> like every third upper body class involved push-ups. Who loves push-ups? Like two people, right? Exactly. All oh, right. We got push-up row here. All right. That's great. But and what's funny is I could tell Coach Ben did not like making us do push-ups. I say us like he knows us, but like he, he, would, he would say, I know whenever I program push-ups, I always get messages via Instagram saying like, how do I get better at push-ups? I hate push-ups. And he's like, I wish that there was a secret. I wish that there was a silver bullet. I wish there was some other exercise I could tell you to do that would make push-ups easier. But the only way to get better at push-ups is to do push-ups. You know this. The only way to get better at push-ups is to do push-ups. And very clearly, he does push-ups. Because he doesn't mind, and he's got the gun. So he's doing push-ups, and he's like, you know, you'll eventually get there. I know you don't like this. And it's funny. So coach doesn't mind, but he knows the students hate it. And I think about that, too, in my pastoral role, that, like, I'm a nerd, and I love Bible study. And so when I'm like, we got this new Bible study, some of you are like, <laughs> and that's okay. That's okay. We all have to grow into different things. There are all certain exercises we like and certain exercises we don't. And so, like, next week we will finish our 10-month sermon series called Learning to Read the Bible because I wanted to help some of you do some spiritual push-ups and try to make them a little bit easier. But the only way to get better at some things, like Bible study and prayer, is to read the Bible and to pray. You only get better by doing it. Well, then, my next step was as we were doing these upper body exercises, particularly doing these certain, like, uh, like overhead presses, they were like, engage your core. And if you're really struggling at this, it may sound counterintuitive, but take some core classes, which core classes are the worst. <laughs> That's abdominals, lower back. Core classes are the worst. And it took me a while to hear this invitation, then it took me a while to actually click into a core class. But the cool thing is, like, the core classes are only five minutes. I was like, I can do anything for five minutes. I cannot do anything for five minutes. It's a five-minute class, and 90 seconds into it, I was laying on the ground trying not to throw up. And that's 90 seconds in when the first 30 seconds is just him saying hello and telling us what we're doing. But the funny part is, so with push-ups, coach didn't mind it, knew the people hated it. Coach Ben hates core classes. <laughs> Through the whole five minutes, he's complaining about doing it. I hate this. I don't like doing this any more than you like doing this. But then by the end of the core classes, he's like, but you know why we do this? Even though we hate it, because the core makes everything better. When you strengthen your core, your balance is better. When you strengthen your core, your lower body is stronger. When you strengthen your core, your upper body is stronger. We all need a strong core. And there are certain spiritual disciplines that are like this too. They're the ones that I like that you don't. And then they're the ones that, I don't know if likes the right word, but there are certain ones of them, like talking about giving, that is not my favorite. This is not the Sunday I dream about. I'm not like in February going, can't wait till October. I know none of you showed up this morning because it's Stewardship Sunday. Some of you may be watching from home today because it's Stewardship Sunday. <laughs> That's just how it goes. And, you know, my seminary professors, my boss at the district would be like, you can't tell them you don't like it, but I like being honest with you. I don't like getting struck by lightning. It's difficult. It's no one's favorite. But like core classes, our practice of generosity and stewardship affects every other part of our spiritual health and every other part of our life. And you know how I know this? Think of how many people you can identify, and you might even be one of them, who credit Dave Ramsey with changing their life. How many of you have ever taken or taught one of Dave Ramsey's classes? How many of you have listened to his radio shows or bought his books? How many of you have done his process? You know what's funny? I ask these kinds of questions all the time, and almost no one ever raises their hand, but a bunch of people just raise their hand. Because this man has a very real and tangible and lasting impact on people. And do you know what he does? He teaches a stewardship Sunday every day on the radio. We hate showing up and hearing it here, but we will call in for the privilege of having him yell at us. People literally call in waiting to be told to cut up their credit card. They are like, they have the scissors ready. They are ready to go. There are people who cannot wait to tell him how much money they're wasting so that he will tell them to stop wasting it. 
He's got some unique principles and unique sayings and a, certainly an interesting personality, but like the core fundamentals are the same. Spend less, save more, pay off debt. And because he teaches it from a biblical perspective, he instructs people as much as you can to tithe even while you're paying off debt. I mean, these are the core points of a stewardship sermon. So why does it make us uncomfortable when we're here, but we'll pay money to have him tell us that at a conference? Well, there's a couple reasons for it. The first is that if you're in Dave Ramsey's off audience, that's, that's self-selected, right? You have shown up because you have a problem or because you find it entertaining or because you want him to tell you this. And again, I doubt any of you showed up this morning specifically because it's Stewardship Sunday. You walked in, you got the envelope in the card, and you were like, oh, crap, I forgot, <laughs> right? <laughs> so some of it is self-selected, right? But I think the bigger and perhaps less obvious reason is for who it feels like it benefits, right? The people who call into Dave Ramsey are calling in because they want help. And they feel like Dave is there on their side to help them. He might give them tough news. He might set them a really rigorous path to get to financial health, but they know it is for their benefit. Now, Dave also benefits. The man makes a fine living. But it feels like he is on your side. And when churches and pastors do Stewardship Sunday poorly, what does it sound like? God told you to give me money. God told you to donate to the church so that I could afford my Peloton. <laughs> when done poorly, it feels manipulative and icky and gross. But when Dave Ramsey does it, it feels like it's a service. And some of this is based on the best intentions by the church. We want to tell you what your gifts to the church can do. And all of these things are true. When you give to God through Lakeside, it makes this Sunday gathering possible. And people who come to the Sunday gathering sing and pray, or listen to us sing <laughs> and pray, and receive communion and hear the word read and proclaimed and build relationships and come to know Jesus. And people are saved, and people are baptized. And when you give to God through Lakeside, it makes life groups possible, through which people build deeper relationships and deeper faith through studying the Bible or social events or serving the community. When you give to God through Lakeside, needs are met through benevolence as we've given over $25,000. And, and we have a fairly tight circle. To, to get benevolence funds from the church, you have to live within 10 miles or know someone connected to Lakeside. We've given over $25,000 to our immediate community to meet needs. When you give to God through Lakeside, children and youth experience and are taught the love of God. When you give to God through Lakeside, we have over 300 members of the community come out on a Saturday in the fall to have fun and to build relationships and to see Lakeside as a place that loves them and cares about them. When you give to God through Lakeside, it keeps the lights on and the grass cut and the toilet paper stocked. And that's not sexy, but how many of you have ever gone into a bathroom with no toilet paper and felt welcome? And when you give to God through Lakeside, because we are a United Methodist Church, you also help us pay our apportionments, which goes to a worldwide denomination. When you give to God through Lakeside, you make a difference down the street and around the world. You fund disaster relief. You fund the salaries of pastors who serve communities that can't afford a pastor. When you give to God through Lakeside, you support United Methodist Colleges and Seminaries. You support Africa University. You support initiatives all around the world. You support college campus ministries. You support the camps and retreat centers. You make a difference. And isn't that exciting? And shouldn't you want to give away your money because it's exciting? You're like, yeah, maybe. I'll think about it. You see, but we're doing it backwards, right? This, this is, I'm trying to get you excited so that you give, right? In this approach, giving is what's called a lag measure. We first try to build you up in your spiritual maturity and excitement so that you then give. And the lead measure is the excitement. And so to kind of put it in biblical terms, it might be where your heart is, there your treasure will be also. Does that sound familiar? Yeah. Yeah. Does that also sound a little wrong? It's backward. The way Jesus says it in Matthew chapter 6 is where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. You know, one of the reasons that, that we do a Sunday like this is because money and our relationship to the power of money is one of the things Jesus talked about the most. 
It's one of the things Jesus talked about that we cover the least, but it's one of the things he talked about the most, perhaps because it is so important and so uncomfortable. And Jesus doesn't really care what other people think about him. He was here to tell us the truth. And of course, when we, when we think about what Jesus teaches, it makes sense. When you buy a stock, what do we call that? We call that an investment, right? When you buy into a company and you see the little letters go by on the bottom of the screen and there's a green up arrow, how do you feel? Yeah! When there's a little red down arrow, how do you feel? When letters to stocks you don't own go by, do you care? No. You care about the ones you're invested in, right? If you've got a friend or a neighbor that needs the service that a company you're invested in sells, what do you do? You recommend it or even buy it for them, right? We are invested in the future of the things we're invested in, not just financially, but emotionally, mentally. It affects us, and we want to help things get better. What happens when we invest in God's kingdom? What happens when we invest in God's kingdom through a church? Of course, that's not a perfect analogy. We're not a stock. That's not how it works exactly. But Jesus says where our treasure is, there our heart is also. And so you know what? We can guide our hearts with our treasure. Rather than waiting to feel plugged in at Lakeside to then invest, what if you invested first? And then your investment might motivate connection. What if your excitement comes from your investment rather than the other way around? And this isn't just about money. Methodist membership vows invite us to invest our prayers, our presence, our gifts, our service, and our witness. Every single person that had a hand in making yesterday the trick-or-treat trail possible invested in God's kingdom through Lakeside. Whether you were here early in the morning setting up tents, whether you were here on Friday set decorating, whether you donated candy, whether you donated money, whether you shared the event on Facebook, whether you prayed, whether you forgave us for a couple stray pieces of hay on the walk up to the front door this morning, our worship team that puts in hours every week for zero dollars to make this possible. They are investing in the kingdom of God through our church. Our ushers are investing in the kingdom of God through our church. Everyone that invests in the kingdom of God through Lakeside is making a difference. It's not just about your money. When you stay next Sunday for the family picnic, you're investing. And when I read scripture, Investing in the kingdom of God always comes with a return. Now, it's, there's no guarantee or promise that it'll be some financial windfall, but there is a return. That may, that may sound a little sketchy and odd, but it sounds sketchy and odd because people like me don't spend enough time sharing with you what Jesus said about finances and the power of money because when we actually look at what Jesus said about money and what the Apostle Paul wrote about money, we'll see that they actually focused a little bit on what the money went to, but they focused so much on what it means to the person who gave. Jesus famously said, don't let your right hand know what your left hand is doing, right? Which was his way of saying, don't be showy with your gifts trying to get earthly praise. But he follows it up with what? When you give in secret, your Father in heaven will see it and will what? Will reward you. Now, Jesus doesn't say, we'll reward you with a return of 1.25% APR. He doesn't say what the return is, how big it is, what form it will come in. But one thing I know about Jesus is he's not a liar. And if he tells us that when we give, our Father in heaven will see it and will reward us, then there is a reward. In Paul's letter to the Philippians, he thanks them for financially supporting his ministry by saying this, I rejoiced greatly in the Lord that at last you renewed your concern for me. That's not how I would start a thank you letter. <laughs> you used to give, you stopped giving, that's okay because you're giving again. But then he follows it up with this. Not that I desire your gifts. What I desire is that more be credited to your account. He basically follows it up by saying, look, you have made my ministry possible. Thank you so much. But you know what? God's got me. God's got a plan for me and my ministry. And if it wasn't you, someone else would have provided. So what makes me excited about your gift is what you get out of it. 
What makes me excited about your gift is that it is a reflection of your spiritual health and maturity. Your willingness to do this is a sign that you are growing in your discipleship. In our main scripture reading from today, Paul writes to the church in Corinth. He said, each of you must give as you have made up your mind, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God lives, loves a cheerful giver. You should never, ever, ever give to the church and especially to Lakeside because you feel manipulated or guilted into giving. He follows it up by saying, and God is able to provide you with every blessing in abundance so that by always having enough of everything, you may share abundantly in every good work. He's reminding us that everything we have is a blessing from God. And so when we give, we are passing on what someone else has given to us. And before this, he talks about the the relationship between sowing and reaping, which people growing up in agricultural Uh, context would have understood if if you want a bigger harvest you plant more seeds right that's just how it works but notice who provides the seeds he says this the god who supplies the seed to the sower and bread for the food will supply and multiply your seed for sowing and increase the harvest of your righteousness god gives us a blessing so that we can participate you know i kind of have this picture like Do you think God knows how great it is to give? Yeah, why? Because literally everything is a gift from God. Do you think God knows how amazing it is to bless someone else? Of course, why? Because every blessing comes from God, right? I think of when I was growing up and uh, we would get gas at a gas station and that was before they had readers, you had to go in and pay and you could also, a $20 bill would more than cover your gas bill. But my parents would give me the $20 bill and send me inside because they knew that it was far more exciting for me to pay the gas station attendant than it was for them. A couple Saturdays ago, we took Auden to the Lake Mary Farmer's Market, and we went to the one farmer and bought a bunch of produce, and we gave her the money because we knew it was so much more exciting for her to give the money to the farmer, and then we had to teach her what changes, and you make sure you get that. But it was so much more exciting for her to give that $20. Was that her $20? No. Had she earned that? No. Had she done her chores that week? No. But I wanted her to have the excitement of giving the money because it was exciting for her. And notice, too, that where is the harvest? Paul says, God will multiply your seed for sowing and increase the harvest of your righteousness. The harvest of your righteousness. In this context, 2 Corinthians, Paul is not collecting for himself in this time. With the Philippians, he was thanking for a gift to his ministry. From the Corinthians, he was gathering a gift for the church in Jerusalem because they were going through a famine at the time. They were going through a famine at the time. And they were literally starving. This gift was critical to their survival as a community. And so you would think that would Paul, Paul would write this really long, emotionally manipulative paragraph about how our brothers and sisters in Jerusalem are really suffering and we need you to give or they're not going to be able to eat. But he makes just some passing comment to they'll be very thankful when they get it. But he focuses on how much it means that they get to participate in it. But what we also can't miss is that Paul injects a dose of reality Paul writes this, through the testing of this ministry, you glorify God by your obedience to the confession of the gospel of Christ and by the generosity of your sharing with them and with all others. Yes, all we have comes from God. And yes, giving benefits the giver. And yes, it brings God's glory and it builds God's kingdom. But that doesn't make it easy. Paul calls it a testing. And this got me thinking about my workouts on Peloton again. The hardest part for me is starting. Now, starting involves changing clothes, sitting on a seat and pushing a button. Is that physically harder than pedaling for 30 minutes? No. But starting is the harder part. Here's here's the the thing I'm, I'm kind of proud of. I have never quit a workout. I've turned the resistance down. I've pedaled slower. I've laid on the ground trying not to throw up after doing one crunch. But I've never quit a workout that I started. But I can't tell you how many workouts I didn't start because I didn't want to or because I thought that that time would be better spent 
elsewhere. And it has taken weeks and months to realize that the one hour I put into the bike, two to three times a week, changes, particularly for me, 1 to 3 p.m. every afternoon and 9 to 12 p.m. at night. I don't, I don't nod off at my desk. I don't need a cup of coffee at 1 o'clock in the afternoon anymore. I sleep better at night. My stress level is down. My clothes fit better except for the sleeves. Like there are benefits. You all know the workouts, the benefits of exercising. And it, sometimes it takes seeing the benefits to understand what the investment does. You see, for me, the block isn't the physical work. It's the mental work. It's the emotional work of starting. And so f- for, for us, when we think about financial stewardship, we need to identify what the block is for us and then come up with little tricks. Like, so for me, just changing into workout clothes is often enough to get me going. That's weird. I know that's weird. But sometimes I get home from work and I immediately change into workout clothes so that when it's 8.15 and Auden is in bed, I tell myself I have no excuse not to go. I'm already dressed, right? So let's figure out what is our own block. Because there's lots of different blocks. For some of us, it may literally be our own resources. For some of us, we just might not have the income or the savings or the financial health. We may have too much debt. We may have lots of financial reasons of our life why, why giving is difficult. For some of us, it might be our financial health. We have plenty, plenty of income, but what we do with it once we have it is another challenge. And we've got people in our congregation who can help you with that. For some, it may also just be a mental and emotional thing, like with me and the bike, just getting started, actually writing that check, placing the first thing in the basket. It might be starting, breaking that seal, and building that momentum. For me, we give uh, online automatically. I get an email once a month, and I try to remember that this is my act of worship, and I say thank you, even though it looks like a bill in my email, but we just, we just give it online, so I don't, I don't have to think about it. I don't have to make the choice. I make the commitment, and then I let the system work for me. And of course, there is one more level over all of this, which Paul puts this way. You will be enriched in every way for your great generosity, which will produce thanksgiving to God through us. For the rendering of this ministry not only supplies the needs of the saints, but also overflows with many thanksgivings to God. A couple weeks ago, we talked about the parable of the dishonest manager. And the takeaway from that was, the resources of this world are finite, and they are limited. But we have access to them right now. What are we going to do with them? Are we going to spend them on things that go away, or are we going to invest them in things that last? which sounds to me a lot like Jesus teaching to store our treasures in heaven and not on earth where moth and rust destroy and thieves break in and steal. But we also have to remember that when Jesus talks about heaven, he's not talking about Disneyland in the clouds. Heaven, according to the Bible, is new creation right here. And there are parts of this creation that will go away. Thankfully, things like pain and sadness and death and depression, and oppression, and violence. But there are things in this world that are beautiful, and are of God, and will last. And so when you give to God through Lakeside, you might supply the toilet paper that is very finite, but that toilet paper plays a small role in a mission that builds the kingdom that lasts. So now, I want to share with you something very exciting that I am grateful that Audrey let me share, and I was hard for her not to include it, um, because I want to give you an example of what it looks like to build the kingdom of God through the church. A while back, there was a family in our church that wanted to make a significant donation, and they gave it unrestricted, but they said, we would ideally like for you to make a direct impact in our local community in a big way, which is a pretty big charge. (laughs) And so... um, you know, we've spent some time dealing with the pandemic, and then we brought this back on the radar, and we spent some time researching uh, and trying to find the best way to honor the wishes of the donor. And we decided to partner with an organization called RIP Medical Debt. And their mission is to remove the burden of medical debt for individuals and families. What they do is they purchase and forgive medical debt, but they not only do that, they then also assist with credit repair. 
Because you may know that owing money is hard enough. The ramifications of owing money are greater than just the number on your statement. And so they try to do a, 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 a really big work as best as they can. And they don't just do this for everyone. They try to target those who are most in need. Earning at or less than two times the federal poverty level, depending on state and family size. Debts that are 5% or more of someone's annual income or family income, or those that are facing insolvency. You need to meet one of these three categories. This oftentimes uh, involves uh, veterans, uh, seniors, single parents, uh, older folks, people living in poverty, those who are just barely in the middle class who will very easily fall into poverty due to medical debt. So that's who they target. This isn't just everybody. They target the people most in need. And to date, they've helped over 2.8 million recipients by purchasing and forgiving $5.1 billion of medical debt. And they have a 100 out of 100 rating on Char uh, Charity Navigator, which is one of those sites you go to to make sure it's a legit organization. So we decided to dedicate the bulk of this gift towards this campaign. We made a total donation of $21,625. 17,300 of it would go directly towards debt purchase and forgiveness. The rest would go to sending letters to the recipients, aiding with credit repair, and aiding with their administrative costs. And our goal was to forgive 100% of the available qualifying medical debt in Seminole County. We anticipated being able to forgive $1.7 million in debt because of the ratio of purchase price to value. In Seminole County, we were able to purchase and forgive the debt of 3,567 individuals and families. And that was 100% of the families in Seminole County. For a total, remember we anticipated 1.7 million, we purchased and forgave 3 million plus dollars. But the money hadn't run out yet. And so it got applied across the state of Florida. Around 200 more individuals and families were added. So in total, 3,732 recipients across 23 Florida counties for over $3.2 million. And of course, this isn't for our glory, is it? It's for the glory of God, right? Over 3,500 individuals and families in this county and over 3,700 statewide will receive a letter telling them that Lakeside United Methodist Church and Preschool, as an act of love and service, has purchased and forgiven their medical debt. And if that isn't the gospel in action, I don't know what is. And of course, we are so grateful to this family that made this donation. But I also hope that you know that you play a role in this. Because if you don't give to God through Lakeside, then there is no Lakeside. And if there's no Lakeside, that family's not at Lakeside. And if that family's not at Lakeside, this doesn't happen. And if even one of those 3,500 Seminole County recipients walk through this door, I hope the lights are on and the AC's on and our staff is here to welcome them and pour into them and build on the relationship that this gift made possible. And I guarantee you that across those 3,700 plus people, there are people who do not believe in God. There are people who are hurt by the church. There are people who are afraid of the church, who are afraid of God, who are skeptical of the church. And they just received a no strings attached blessing that our community made possible. And of course, I mean, it's amazing the, the size and the scope but I hope that through today's message, what you've heard and understood is that totals are great, impact is great, but one dollar doesn't get donated unless the person has the heart of a giver. Not a single dollar gets donated to God through Lakeside or anywhere else unless people recognize that this is what we are called to do and that God calls us to be a blessing. And so, of course, when you give to God through Lakeside, you're helping to build the kingdom of God 
through exciting and, and, and ways that help people in very real ways. And being part of building the one true kingdom, the one that'll last, is a privilege and a blessing for us too. And so what I want to invite you to do for the next couple of minutes is to just begin or continue the conversation with God about what you might want to do in 2022. Whether it's giving to God through Lakeside or giving to God through other ways. We're going to have uh, Rob come up and play for about 90 seconds or so, for, so you have some time to just reflect and pray. And this is the point where you can pull out your card. And I want you to know that, that what I'm about to invite you to do is not me asking for something from you, but praying for you that you would receive as a part of this. And so the way that we have done pledges at Lakeside, and look, you're welcome to do it however you want, but the way that I recommend that you do pledges is to think through a percentage of your 2022 income that you might want to give to God through Lakeside and to write that down on the card. And what I like about that is that is a dynamic pledge. So if 2022 is a great year, it gives you the opportunity to return more to God because God has given you more. But if 2022 is the year that the bottom falls out, that's okay too. And you don't have some dollar amount weighing over your head. I also like that because whether our income is $100 or a million dollars, we can both write 3% or 7% or 10% or 11% or 12%. All things are equal at the foot of the cross. There is no hierarchy in this church. And then the last thing that I'll tell you is whatever you write on the card, whether you write something or whether you put a blank card in the envelope as a way of saying, Pastor Dan, you're kind of springing this on me. I'm not ready to write something down. That's okay. Bringing a blank card in your envelope is still a tangible way of saying, I'm going to make this an intentional thing that I figure out later. But what I want you to do is I want you to seal that envelope and I want you to write your name and if you think we don't have it, your address on it. Because this week we are going to return it to you sealed. We're not going to rip it open. We're not going to hair dry it open and secretly seal it back. Because I'm not asking you to give to us. I'm asking you to give to God through us. And that's a commitment you make with God. So for the next 90 seconds or so, I would love for you to spend some time in prayer and reflection. You're welcome to write on the card whatever you want because you're the one who's going to open it and read it later this week. And then uh, when you come forward for communion, you can place it in these baskets as a tangible, physical act of worship. So let us pray and reflect together.